Well, y'all talk about the, the beginning on all of it, because I'm just, I come in on the very first. <laughs> 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 Keep it straight. Give me the microphone now. I'm younger than you all. Okay. Well, most of you know me, but if you don't, my name is Jake Foster. I was born September 13, 1926, 1926, at Shannon, Arkansas. My mother and dad were uh, teaching school there. It was a two-room school, and they furnished, uh, in those days, if it was a, a man and wife, they furnished... Uh, a place to live, and they called it a teach region. And I was born in the teacher deli uh, and delivered by Doc Brown. So that brings you up to where I started. Uh, in the twenties, in the twenties, uh, was the good times. Uh, mother and dad were doing well teaching. Uh, sometime uh, around 19 and uh, after the flood in 27, 1928, uh, Dad took the horse and buggy back out to the farm and bought a Ford automobile, which was big time. Well, as time went on, uh, the 29 arrived, and all of you are have heard of the 29 crash. Well, that stopped everything. I mean, the bank closed, uh, uh, the production stopped, people stopped buying. It wasn't overproduction, it was underconsumption. People just quit buying because of the lack of money. Well, uh, just shortly after the banks closed and the money dried up, uh, the county went broke. And mother and dad were teaching, and at that time mom was making $40 a month, and that was for the month that she taught, not, not uh, annually, but if she taught a month, she got paid her $40. Uh, if they let out for cotton picking, she didn't get paid. Uh, Dad was making $60 a month. <clears throat> well, the, uh, as I say, the county went broke and they started paying in vouchers. And this said if the county ever gets 60 or $40, you can turn it in and get your money. Well, there was still a few people left in the county that had money. And uh, you could take those vouchers and use them for anything that uh, you uh, that the county had. You could pay your taxes. You could buy a farm that was being sold for taxes, or anything the county uh, you owe the county. You could use that. So some of the people who still had a little money would give you fifty cents on the dollar for your vouchers. Well, it didn't take long that mom and dad starved out. Now here in Pocahontas and Randolph County, we were much fortunate over uh, the metropolitan areas. My uh, grandparents had a nice farm out here on Fosha River. They had hogs and cattle and big gardens and uh, corn to make cornmeal out of. And so uh, on the weekends, uh, we would, uh, load up that uh, A model and go to the farm and load up on groceries. Well, it didn't take long that we couldn't buy the gas, so Dad went back and got the horse and buggy. So that was our uh, mode of transportation. Uh, as uh, time lingered on up into the uh, 30s, early 30s, uh, they got a chance to go over to uh, Clay County and school over there was paying in cash, so they got a job over there. So that was a great change, and they bought a 10 acres and a house for $1,200. Well, that was big time again. But again, Clay County tried it up. 
we were back again. So mother and dad borrowed $500 from a lady in Corning, and my grandfather England put up his house, which was clear, uh, for the $500 so they could buy a little grocery store up in, in Sykeston, Missouri. And they uh, started up there, and uh, fortunately, my dad, dad did pretty doggone good, you know. And I didn't realize we was poor, but uh, <coughs> Sykeston, Missouri was loaded with millionaires in those days. In fact, there was five widowed ladies out of one fine that well over a million dollars. And so there was money floating around up there. Well, I didn't know I was poor, but one day out on the school ground, there was three or four of us out there, and two little boys was talking, and one of them said, you going to invite Jake uh, to your birthday party? He said, no, he's a poor boy. <laughs> well, I shook my head. When I got home, I asked Mom, I said, Mom, are we poor? She says, Son, yes, in money, we're poor. But said, we're very rich because we're a family. That's right. So that brought uh, a lot to bear on my future. Well, I don't want to take up too much time, but uh, I have always been interested in retail. And uh, in those days, we had Sears, we had... Uh, uh, J.C. Penney, we had uh, Kroger, uh, we had uh, oh, uh, Montgomery Ward, uh, we had uh, Piggly Wiggly, we had A&P, uh, we had Sterling's 5 and 10, and we had Hattie King and uh, uh, <laughs> Joe Pete's, so uh, we did well, did well. Uh, in those days, uh, most of the retail big ones were doing pretty well, even with the Depression. But uh, the factories were down, and uh, so uh, the economy uh, rocked on. But we had some good things during that time. The railroads. You know, the railroads run on time in those days. And uh, the uh, postal department was great. You know, we think about texting today, you know, where you take your telephone and do all of that. Gosh, we had that back then. It was a penny postcard. Yeah. <laughs> you could fill out a penny postcard, drop it in the mail, and it'd be uh, across the state tomorrow. And the trains that went through here, I think in those days there was about three trains a day, and every one of them had a mail car. And the post office would drop a, 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 a package of, or a sack of mail for every train that went through. Now, if he didn't stop, he still picked up that sack of mail. They had a big arm that caught it and brought it in. So mail was on time. So we did have some, some very fine things. Now, if you really want to uh, get interested in the Depression, there's two or three books that everybody should read. Of course, Grapes of Wrath by Steinbeck. We all are very familiar with that. And then there's God's Little Acre. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I don't know if, how many have read that. Yeah. And then there's Tobacco Road. Oh, yeah. Those tell you about the real down-to-earth poor folks. Uh, so at this point, I'm going to turn it over to Ann. All right. I, 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 you probably were more... Let me hold this up a little closer because your voice is nice. I don't know whether I can uh, remember as much as Jake has or not. 
Right. Why first? We can't hear you. We're, we're getting Just slide it, it all the way up, man. Yeah, and leave it there. Yeah. Just leave it there. Yeah. David will the 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 Okay. Can you hear me, baby? Yes. Yeah. Uh, my first knowledge of the, the uh, depression, and I didn't know that that's what it was. Uh, I woke up one morning when the phone rang. My two sisters my, were twins. And they woke up at, when the phone rang. They slept together, and I slept about 10 feet away from them in my room on a half bed. And uh, when the phone rang, Daddy got up and answered the phone. And then he put the phone down and told my mother, the bank went broke last night. I didn't know what that meant, but I was to find out. Every bank in Randolph County went broke except the bank of Biggers. Frank ought to know about that. I think the Biggers owned it. And they moved their, that bank of Biggers down here, and it became the bank of Pocahontas. And I want to ask you, did, did any of you know what a poor farm is? We had a poor farm here, and this was much before the Depression. And I used to visit an old friend. She is an old friend now. We're both 94. I'll be 95 next month. And uh, she will be, she's a month or two older than I. She lives in Silver Springs, Maryland, and we talk by phone about once a year or two. <laughs> two. And uh, Roberta Stubblefield, she lived on Newberry Road going to, to uh, Mill Creek. Yeah. And uh, I'd go out there and have the best time because I to me, that was like going to the country. And uh, it, she lived only a block or two from the poor farm. And she'd take me up there, and the people that ran the poor farm, the Childresses, would let us go in and visit all these old people who were so poor that they couldn't live by themselves anymore. There was no Social Security. There was no any of the other things that we have today to take care of people who cannot live alone. And uh, there must have been 20, 25 men and women together the most. There were three or four uh, buildings for them. They all ate in the same large room uh, once a, uh, three times a day. And the rest of the day, they were, the men, of course, had their rooms that they lived in, and the women were in theirs. And they were very old. And uh, one of the men was, what was his name, that was, was with, uh, he used to play an, an instrument and sing every day at Van Atkins. Ed Cardinal. Ed Cardinal. That's where I met Ed. And <laughs> <laughs> So I always enjoyed hearing that engine yeah. and uh, different people like that. And uh, his uh, wife, he uh, married later. Uh, he met her, of course, uh, when he came to town. And uh, uh, different people like that that I met there at the poor farm, I would get to see them later in town. And. Uh, also, uh, I, I was to learn that 
when, when the bank went broke, uh, we lost what little money the Star Herald had. And I heard from Grandma Blankenship, my dad's mother, about those old bankers <laughs> that took all her money. <laughs> and fortunately, she had heard from Grandpa, who had died in 1930. And Grandpa had come to her in a dream and told her to get her money out of the bank and buy her home on Thomasville. And fortunately she did that and that got most of her money out of the bank before it went broke. And uh, all I heard was those old bankers for the next 30 years. <laughs> finally, I asked Daddy one day, how much was Grandma's fortune that she lost in the bank? Well, it must have been at least $2,000. <laughs> and I was rather disappointed. I hoped that it was more than that. <laughs> but I guess at that time it must have been quite a bit. But anyway, uh, it wasn't long after this happened, that, that through going to school and everything and hearing the other kids talk, I heard about <clears throat> Hoover, the president had, who had gone out and, and Roosevelt had come in and he was going to save us. And I saw these signs on the Star Herald window. REA and uh, NRA, National Recovery Act, I asked Daddy what they stood for. WPA, yeah. Works Progress Administration, and people made a lot of fun of that WPA. They said all they did was lean on their <laughs> shovels. <laughs> and, uh, what, nobody had work and, and they, they couldn't make any money. Nobody had any money to buy groceries with. And uh, so Roosevelt put them to work doing things for each community. And he uh, installed the CCC, the, the civilian conservation conservation camp and put young men to work doing things for the county. And uh, these were things that, I mean, they did things that even today can be seen mm -hmm. that helped uh, counties. And uh, uh, the WPA, they would go out and fix roads and things that really needed to be done, but that the county couldn't afford to, to pay for. And uh, that was the type of things that he uh, saw that got done and, and put people to work so they could make money. And uh, that way people got enough money to pay for things, and that's how I started hearing about uh, all people eight, they, they t told me, were Hoover apples and Hoover hogs. <laughs> Hoover apples were turnips and Hoover hogs were rabbits. <laughs> and they tell me that's all they had to eat. And it wasn't bad, they could live on it, but every meal <coughs> gets a little old that way. And uh, that was why they got tired of hearing about Hoover. And uh, I know that I read that uh, uh, President Roosevelt and Hoover, when they rode, from the to the 
White House from where they were on, on Inauguration Day. They didn't speak because Mr. Hoover wouldn't speak to Mr. Roosevelt. Mr. Roosevelt had made fun of him. And that's the way politicians do. Uh, I told you I didn't know a lot about the Depression because I wasn't the right age to know about it. But I have heard a lot about it from my parents and such. You can just say what you want to me. <laughs> Well, I think that, I really think Linda and John Allen had me to do this tonight, to make me have to tell my age. <laughs> I wouldn't do that. Sure. Yes, oh. they would do that. But I was born on September the 7th, 1931, in an old house out here, right across the highway from the old Randolph County Hospital in Randolph Home. And my mother lived in that house. Uh, until she was 94 years old when she passed away. So I grew up out on what back then was almost out in the country. And I do remember as, I, of course that was right in the middle part of the depression. And then it was about five years before I realized, you know, how hard it, everybody was having it, like my parents. Mother and daddy worked very hard. Uh, Daddy worked at the Salee Handle Factory, and my mother raised a huge garden uh, and canned, and she had a cow, so we had milk and butter. She had lots of chickens, so we always had eggs, and we had a lot of fried chicken and chicken and dumplings and chicken and dressing and every way you could do chicken. And every year they would buy a little pig and raise it and feed it, and we would have our pork and mother would, mother and daddy would do their sausage. It was a big deal at our house when they made the sausage because they always got in a fight. <laughs> because daddy wanted to put a whole lot of hot pepper and mother didn't want a lot of hot pepper. So, but then mother would pressure can that sausage and it was wonderful when you opened a jar of that home, homemade sausage. And even today, I love hot sausage, and I think I get that from my daddy. I'll only buy hot sausage. <laughs> but, you know, we had a hard, hard time, but yet they didn't have cash money. But we were so rich in what we had because at that time, we had a roof over our head. They were buying their house from, of all people, John Kaiser. And they made payments, and I was going to bring some receipts tonight, and I forgot them. And, uh, and it's not because I'm old that I'm getting forgetting. <laughs> just had a lot on my mind. But anyway, uh, they would pay John Kaiser so much a month. And when uh, his second wife, Rosina, died, he came to Mother and asked her to do his white shirts for him because he couldn't wash and iron them. And uh, she did. And... So part of her payment on the house would be from doing the laundry. And uh, so they managed finally to get the house paid for. And, and we had lots to eat. We didn't, they didn't have a lot of cash money, but we always had plenty of food. We had uh, fruit trees and blackberries and everything you could think of on that small area of ground. And my mother would get up early in the morning work in her garden, and then she might can all day on a wood cook stove yep. in the hot summertime. So no air conditioning or anything. We had an ice box and a uh, Salee ice plant. Mr. Lemons would bring the ice around once a week. And uh, you had an ice card, which I would love to have Mother's ice card, but when I asked her about it years later, I said, Mother, where, what did you ever do with your, the ice card we had? She said, I tell you, I was so glad to get an electric refrigerator. I, refrigerator, I threw that darn thing away along with the ice box. <laughs> but when, when you wanted your ice that week, the card had
had in each corner was 25, 50, 75, or 100, and you would set it in your window with the point up of what amount of ice you right. wanted, and Mr. Lemons would bring in the block of ice, and it would do you all week. And all of us kids loved to run out there, and when he drove up, because in the hot summer time, he'd always chip off little pieces of ice and give us, and that was a lot of fun to have some ice, because we were not allowed to chip off the ice inside. Mother would not let us. We had a milk cow, and during that time, all of the neighborhood people had cows, and they would take their cows down to Kaiser Pasture every morning and leave it all day for the cow to graze. And where's that? And that was down behind Price Chopper. Give me time. It's Ball's Field. It's Ball's Field now, but back then it was known as Kaiser Pasture because Mr. Kaiser owned all of that property down in there. So, uh, my sister, Linda's mother, that was one of her chores because we all had chores and you didn't have time to be bored. You never heard a kid back then say, I'm bored. <laughs> we played all day. We were running around all over town. You didn't have to be scared about anything. You could get out and do what you wanted to do. But anyway, my poor sister, had to take that cow every morning and turn it into Kaiser Pasture. Then late every afternoon she had to go get it and bring it back to the house, you know, to be milked and all. She hated it. Well, she'd go down there and she couldn't find the cow. She'd have to find because everybody was taking their cows down there, so there was a lot of cows. So one time she, on her own, found a little can of blue paint. <laughs> so she painted the cow's hooves blue. <laughs> well, then Daddy saw it. He said, what in the world? Well, she said, it's too hard to find that cow every day, but if I can see the blue hooves. <laughs> but unfortunately, he made her take the paint off. <laughs> well, then we did not have a car until I was up quite a bit older. Uh, we weren't as rich. My family wasn't as rich as Jake's. We didn't have a car. And we didn't have a horse and buggy. So we walked everywhere. And we walked to school every day from out that far up to on Marsh Street where the big old school used to be. And for 12 years I walked every day. My sister walked every day and my brother. But every day when my sister came into town, she came through the hallway of the old courthouse, and she went to school. Afternoon, when school was out, we'd be walking home, but she would cut off from me and my brother and all the other kids, because there was kids everywhere walking yeah. to school, you know. And she'd go through that courthouse, and uh, always, she walked through that courthouse twice a day for 12 years. <laughs> Did she ever give you a reason? No, she just loved the old courthouse. Well, she just always and loved to come up and see it, didn't she, Linda? Mm -hmm. You always had to drive her up through town when Linda would <laughs> take her for drives. We always had to come up and drive around the square. Well, so she she see if the courthouse was still there. <laughs> but we had, uh, like I said, we didn't have a car, so when Mother would have to buy staple groceries, her flour and sugar and cornmeal, things like that, they would, Mother and Daddy would come to town on Saturday afternoon and go to Waldron's, Terry Waldron's grocery store, and they would buy the things that they needed there. But Mr. Waldron had a delivery service, <laughs> so for all the people that would walk to town, buy their groceries, and leave them there, and then later on, those boys would deliver them. Well, the boys were really good friends of mothers and daddies. They were two just great young boys, just teenagers, I'm sure. Uh, one of them was, his name was Gerald Ballou, and his family lived here in Pocahontas for many years. And the other one, Ann and I can't remember his first name, but his last name was Watkins. And they delivered the groceries. Well, they loved to come to our house. And so Mother and Daddy's 
groceries were the last on the list on Saturday nights, and sometimes it was 10 or 11 o'clock before they would get there. But mother and daddy, mother would always have maybe hot chocolate or something, iced tea, and she'd have cookies or something, and they'd come in, and they'd always stay a while. And uh, if mother bought a big jar of peanut butter, well, back then, your peanut butter, I think they have some now that you can buy like that, that the oil is separate from the peanut butter. And you, they would, one of these boys would take a, a knife and stir and stir and stir that, and then we'd all sit down and they'd have peanut butter and crackers. They just loved to do that. And we loved those boys. They were, it was like Christmas on Saturday nights when they brought the groceries. We dearly loved when they came. I was just little, but oh, I just, it was always just like, like a party at our house. But one Saturday night, unfortunately, the boys left the house, and the next day we found it out, my daddy did, that they had been killed in the car wreck that night. So that was a sad time. But the Blue family did live here for many years, and Mr. Blue worked at the post office, and they were a nice family. But anyway, it was just anything back then was a lot of fun, you know, because we didn't we didn't get to do a lot. We didn't have a lot of toys, so we no TV, no television, no <laughs> cell phones, no tablets, no nothing like that. But you know what we did have that I think was so wonderful. We had imagination. We came up with our own games and our own fun and. The kids in our neighborhood would play until way after dark every night. They just, we were out playing and running and having fun and... Did you make your own paper dollies? I cut out a 10 jillion paper dolls out of a Sears and Roebuck catalog. We would spend hours playing paper dolls or playing jacks or things like that. But you didn't, we didn't get a lot of toys. We didn't have... Anything, and I've made so many mud pies. I always said that's how I learned to cook. <laughs> made delicious mud pies. Well, we would, once in a while, Grandmother didn't know it, but we'd put an egg in our mud pie and put some water. Yeah, I'm talking about jobs that we hated. Well, when Mother and Daddy, when we'd get in the fall of the year, and Mother would harvest her garden. She always had uh, potatoes, lots and lots of potatoes that they spread out under the house in a, kind of a dirt basement we had. And they had onions that they would tie three onions to a bundle and hang along the floor rafters or whatever you call them, floor joists to the house. And they'd be there all winter. You had onions and potatoes and they kept really good. But it was spidery, scary. And I was little, and so that was my job. Mother would say, Virginia, go, go into the house and get me so many potatoes and some onions. And I'd say, I don't want to. I'm scared. There's spiders under there. And I'd have to go through spider webs. But anyway, I survived it. So, But, you know, we did have chores. And my brother's chore was to chop wood bring in heating wood and in the winter and and uh, wood for the cook stove in the summer and uh, uh, you know but as things progressed and then World War II came because up until World War II the depression was still really hurting people and by then I was getting up older and realized uh, I was like Jake we were really poor but I didn't know it. Yeah. And my mother was a seamstress, and she sewed for people all over town. And to tell you of, of one of my mother's days, she started early in the morning, and she would work in her garden, you know, when, during the summer. She canned, and she would cook and wash. She had a, a big wash tub out in the yard. She would bolt her white clothes in, and she washed on a rubber board. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, then she sewed for people. So in the evenings, after we got through with the supper, and Geraldine and I had our fight in the kitchen because we fought every night for I don't know how many years 
because she washed the dishes and I dried them. And I would always find something on a dish, and I'd say, you didn't get this one clean, and then we'd have a fight. And then, then after she got a job and started working in the dime store when she was in high school, she'd say, I'll pay you a quarter. She'd have a date with Max. I mean, Max was a fly in the ointment. She always had a date with Max. And she'd say, I'll pay you a quarter if you'll do the dishes tonight. And I'd say, no, I'm not going to. Okay, well, I'll give you 50 cents if you'll do the dishes, because Max will be here in a little while, and I've got to get ready for my day. So I made a little money that way, <laughs> and I'd wash and dry the dishes. But uh, we, we just always, you know, we all had our chores, and we all knew we didn't. We really, truly were not allowed to complain about the chores we had, because we knew better, our daddy would get us if we <laughs> complain too much. But I can remember going to bed at night and hearing Mother's treadle sewing machine because that's when she would do her sewing and she would sew most of the night. And she sewed for people all over town and, uh, and many times uh, she would, Miss, uh, Mrs. Balls here in town, Miss Gay Balls, would bring dolls out every year uh, in the early part of the winter she would bring two or three dolls for her daughters and a big stack of fabric and mother would make wardrobes and everything for those dolls for Christmas. It was just unbelievable. And when they had a play at school they would bring mother the patterns and all the fabrics and she would make all the costumes and, uh, and plus she made all of our clothes. She made everything we wore. So Miss Mary Salee was my third grade teacher. Uh, she was third grade teacher here for a lot of years before she went back to school and got her degree to be a home, home economics teacher. Uh -huh. First home ec teacher and I was in her first class that she had at our school. But I was in the third grade and so one time before Christmas she said, and she told this to every class I think that she ever taught in home economics. She would said, well, okay, I'm going to go down the aisles today and have each one of you tell me something you really want for Christmas. So we were little third graders, you know, and so she started down the aisle. When she got to me, Virginia, what would you like to have for Christmas? And I said, a store-bought dress. <laughs> but anyway, we, we all survived the Great Depression and growing up and... No place on earth could have been better than Pocahontas to grow up in because we had freedom, we had safety, safety we, and we had the Imperial Theater on Saturday afternoons. <laughs> and we walked as a family, we walked to church on Sundays from out there all the way up to the Baptist Church where it is now. And, uh, and then walked back home and then we walked back at night and went to church and walked back home after church. Daddy said he never got so tired of anything in all his life that he carried me home from that Baptist church till my feet broke on the ground because I always had the leg ache every Sunday night. <laughs> but anyway, we'll see if Ann or Jake wants to add something else to the oh, Great of, Depression. I thought of something. Uh, we had had a way we had a way of there wasn't much money of course in the depression and at the star herald it got to the point that a lot of people didn't want to have to do without their subscription to the paper so they'd come in and ask daddy or aunt Eunice whomever happened to be the editor at the time could I pay for my subscription in so-and-so? And I don't have any money. And she'd say, yes, bring it on in. Well, that habit lasted until the 60s or 70s <laughs> or past. We, uh, we would get canned goods. We would get uh, wood to burn in our stoves, 
we would get a little bit of everything, and it would be anything but money. But people didn't want to do without the paper, and they wanted to pay their subscription, but they didn't have any money. And Grandma's uh, basement of her home was a wonderful place to store potatoes, and she always had bushels of potatoes. That's where we went to get our potatoes. We never bought them at a store. We knew Grandma had plenty of potatoes because that's where people that wanted to pay for their pres pres prescription in potatoes, it, it was Grandma's basement. And something else that was even better my lands, uh, Burris and Henry Smith never paid for their ad in the paper. <coughs> we got to go to the show free. <laughs> <laughs> well, and it, I never paid to have a perm or get my hair set. The whole family got to go to Mary Burke's and Hattie King's and their beauty shops. We never had to pay for that. They, they wanted to exchange advertising for hairdos. <laughs> and so, until I married, I never paid for a hairdo of any kind. That's right. Yes. Those are just things I happen to think of. Jake, you got all you ladies have just shocked my memory back. <laughs> A couple of them. Uh, the Iceman you were talking about. Uh, well, he had an ice box and mom would get 10 pounds twice a week. And the card was always in the window. So one morning I was messing around, so I took the card and turned it upside down and put a 50 pound. Uh, <laughs> well, this ice man from Corning, and there's probably some people in here know him, but uh, he brought in 50 pounds of ice. And Mom met him at the door and he said, Edna, what in the world are you going to do with 50 pound of ice? I, box you've got will only hold 10 pounds. And she said, 50 pounds? He said, yeah. I didn't order 50 pounds. He said, look in your window. There was a 50 pound sign. You can imagine I got talked to pretty straight. <laughs> Another one is uh, uh, the Hoover Hawks. One time we were uh, my grandfather, England, and I were out walking around, and we walked all the way over to Success. And there was a store there, and it was in wintertime. And across the front of that store was rabbits hanging. I'll bet you there was 50 to 60 rabbits hanging up there. And I said, Paul, what in the world are those? And he said, oh, that's them Hoover Rab uh, Hoover Hall. He said, he's selling those. And I sure, sure enough, I said, well, we've got a, a box out, and you catch all of ours. And he said, yeah, but said they some people too lazy to get their own. Uh, so that was, that was a very interesting uh, time for me. Another incident, uh, talking about pigs, uh, the, cra uh, the card come over one uh, day on the mail and it said, Edna, the corn's in roastinary stage, you and Pete ought to come over over the weekend and we'll can corn. Well, that was a, a good thing because they always put up enough corn to last for the winter. So we drove over and at that time, uh, uh, gas was only uh, 12 cents a gallon or 10 gallon for a dollar, but uh, we were able to take the uh, Ford over and uh, so we, uh, mom and, and my grandmother canned corn all day and we got ready to go home and my grandfather said, Pete said, you know, said, I just weaned a litter of pigs out here and he said, why don't you pick out one of them and, 
and take it back and, and raise it. And Dad said, well, that's a good idea. So they went out and picked out a pig and put it in a rumble seat. And uh, we headed back home. And we had to cross the ferry over on Kirk River out of uh, Reno there. And so we were going across the ferry. And all at once that pig jumped out of the back of that rumble seat, jumped off of the ferry, and the last thing we saw was that pig going down Kirk River. <laughs> we ain't seen that pig since. <laughs> yeah. Now they're talking about the uh, worth of something. In those days, uh, groceries, uh, best bologna you could buy was 12 and a half cents a pound. Salt meat was about three cents a pound. And uh, uh, some of the uh, uh, boys would come in for lunch and they'd say, gives me a dime's worth of that bologna and some crackers. Well, we cut off a chunk of bologna about like that. Uh, so, uh, uh, number two cans, that 16 ounce size cans, were a nickel piece or six for a quarter. And a uh, 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 bar of soap was a nickel or a dime. Uh, the best round steak you could buy would sometimes go up as high as a quarter a pound. And uh, uh, when you'd buy a side of beef, you'd say, you want me to throw in uh, a liver and a heart? You know, <coughs> it, it was worth nothing. And worth, no, worth nothing, one day my, uh, I was out at my grandfather's, and he knew every wagon across those hills, and he heard one coming, and he said, there comes old so-and-so. wonder what he's at. So he drove up, and they changed the time of day. And, uh, he said, George said, I need a load of corn. And my grandfather said, well, okay, Joe. said, you know where the crib is. So he went out, and he loaded his wagon up with a load of corn and come back and stop. We went out on the porch. He said, now, George, he said, I don't know when I can pay you for this corn. My grandfather said, well, Joe. It don't matter, it ain't worth nothing anyhow. <laughs> and that was true, it just wasn't worth anything. What about and, the river? Was there any activity on the river that was going on during when you all were kids? And, uh, river boats. Uh, I remember river boats going up and down yeah. the river. Uh, river boats to go up and down the Yeah, there was still, still boats coming up. There were houseboats too, weren't there? People living down there. Houseboats? Yes. Oh, they houseboats. were in my I time. think we all remember the houseboats oh, that were along the river. And, uh, and we've all fish. seen the bridge turn a number of times too, oh, I'm yeah. sure. I know I have. We lived where we could see the bridge. Uh, and, uh, yeah. and that and bridge it, it would was turn. Kind of those whole big, time. Uh, big things, and we hear it was the bridge was going to turn. Uh, <laughs> and watch it. Yeah. So needless to say, I have not got over the fact yet that the bridge is gone. Yeah. <laughs> I know. Well, we've lost another. Yeah. One of the respects that I got from my father was, as I say, we had this little grocery store. And we carried the farmers from gin whistle to gin whistle. And this was during the sharecrop days. And uh, this one fella had given Dad uh, a mortgage on uh, a cow and a sow and something else. I don't remember exactly what. But anyhow, the fall came and uh, he was still getting his groceries and charging them. And we didn't, hadn't collected anything. So one day he said, I think Jake said, let's drive out and see if we can get some money out of So and so said, you know, I've got bills to pay. And so uh, we got in the car and went out. And the old boy was out in the lot. And, uh, 
he said, talk to Dad, and he said, well, Pete said, I guess you're after some money. Dad said, well, I sure would like to have some. He said, Pete said, I just ain't got it. And he said, now, I know I give you a mortgage on this cow that sow, and whatever. What else was something, I don't know, but anyhow, it had disappeared or died or something. And he said, now, he said, this old cow's just come fresh. And he said, sows do drop a litter any time now. He said, now, if you want them, said, get you a trailer and come and get them. About that time, four or five, that old kid ran them from about ten to about three, come running out the yard, barefooted and, you know, looked like everything. And Dad said, well, he said, uh, what are you going to do? He said, well, I don't know. He said, the mill keeps these kids going. Dad looked at me and he said, Jake, get in the car. <laughs> we went home. As bad as we needed the money, Dad saw the need for somebody who needed it work. Yeah. When that corn about ten cents a bushel? Huh? When that corn about ten cents a bushel? Yeah, if you could get that. But uh, my dad, or my grandfather, had a thing about corn. In bad weather, we go down to Corn Crib, and he had a sheller, and we go uh, still in the shuck, you know. Of the, so we'd start shucking corn, and he'd go through, and the very finest ears with straight rows and so many numbers and everything, he put that aside for seed corn. The next corn. We saved to make meal out of. The next ears went to the horses. The next went to the cattle. And the nubbins went to the hogs. But that was his his method of uh, keeping his corn separated. Well, hogs aren't no, no, but they were fed uh, Blue John milk and come off the separator. They got all of the Blue John milk. And what was it like around the square when you were little? Yes, Peters and Hubert Peters would always give me an ice cream soda. <laughs> and where was that store? Huh? Where was where well, were that? It was in the middle of right here. Of it's on the end. Up, up above, you can go past Main uh, or uh, Mar, and it, they were in the middle of every set of ties that uh, Yeah. Well, when I was growing up, they were on the corner. Joe Peach was on the corner. Yeah. Well, he or, I wasn't. What, it wasn't Joe Peach. They weren't Joe Peach. Well, they his, were the powers his sister. Club. His sister ran it. Yeah. Oh, you're talking about little Bibby. Yeah. The little Bibby. <laughs> yeah. Uh huh. Yeah, that's we're where talking I mean. about best Peters. Uh huh. It was different. Uh huh. They were different Peters. Oh yeah. Oh, oh. There were <laughs> many different Peters. Okay. Uh -huh. I'd have give a fortune for that penny uh, gum machine that oh, was in your Oh, yeah, yeah. Man, I, that. I watched that thing. <coughs> I loved that. I loved to have that penny gum machine. 
Well, now I'm fixing to tell how old I am again, but I remember very well as a little child when they paved the highway, Highway 62 that goes around from Polk County around to Embo. Daddy was mayor. Yeah. 32. Mm -hmm. I was going to ask Ann when they paved Thomasville, because at that time. At what time? At that time. 32. It was right at 32. 32. Daddy okay. was the mayor. He said, well, while you're here doing this other paving, well, just do Thomasville to you. That's when they did it. When was Thomasville paved? Around uh, 32. Daddy served from around 30 to didn't it stop about where Bill Bartha lived there? Uh, it stopped at why? No, the Thomasville. Thomasville. Going out, where did it stop? Thomasville. Oh, it stopped at why? Oh, at Parks. Oh, yeah. Isn't that why? I thought you found Uh-huh. But Long Leewood, as they get, as a part of Thomasville would get hard, would we skate. We enjoyed that. Mm -hmm. yeah. I remember when they paved 115 going to Maynard, because we used to go on, that. that's the awfulest road in the world to try to drive on with all the rocks and the curves and everything. And they finally, I don't remember what year it was, but they finally... Sid McMath was governor. Oh, really? Okay. <laughs> he told me a story about that. I remember them doing that, and that's the only one I remember them doing. When was it? It was in the late 40s or early 50s when Sid McMath was governor. Because yeah. when I was little, Sid, we, we took ice yep. out to my grandmother's every few days. Mother always got car sick on that road. So my dad and I, it was we awesome. take that trip. Yeah, that I was, uh, there was hills on that road that you had to back your T-model Ford up backwards to get up on. Yeah. Because the front oh, bands yeah. were... Yeah. We used to have to back, back up that road. Going down to Burdale. Oh, yeah. Well, my grandpa lived. It was that road where they just put the, all those apartments up. Oh, yeah. Yeah, because we started up it one day, and Aunt Eunice was driving. You couldn't get and up she, it in one she time. She got halfway up it and started back, yeah. and I thought we were going in that big yeah. hole. <laughs> I got where I would go with that. My grandpa lived up at the top of that hill, and we, when we'd go out to visit him, we'd get, like you say, about halfway up the hill. And you'd have to, everybody would jump out of the car to get out of the car. She couldn't get out of the car. Another thing was the gas tank was on their model pieces back at the back, and it was gravity fed. And if you didn't have a full tank of gas, the gas would all run to the back. Oh, mercy. 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 Oh, got our uh, subscriptions paid in canned goods. One time, one time, somebody brought us a whole about 12 quarts of something. We didn't know what it was, so we opened it. It was only canned, uh, when, <laughs> when Mama opened it, it warmed it up. It was just cabbage. Cabbage! And absolutely didn't, didn't have anything in it. To, no taste, no, no, no butter, no, no nothing. It was terrible. Uh -huh. And another time, Grandma was so happy, uh, a woman had given her an entire box uh, of quarts of green beans, and she invited all of us to a big green bean me meal with ham and everything. <laughs> we couldn't eat it because <laughs> the woman had, had canned it with vinegar. <laughs> <laughs> and it, 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 the green beans taste like pickles. <laughs> Put vinegar in, in these, and we've got to 
12 whole parts. <laughs> she said, well, we always put vinegar in our uh, green beans, so we won't have, uh, what is it she get? Botulism. Botulism. Oh. My grandma said, I'd rather have botulism. <laughs> 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 and what about going to the doctor? Did you go to the doctor back then when you were little? call us all in and here would set these three little glasses of plum juice can't stand plums to this day <laughs> and she would be there with a bottle of castor oil uh -huh. oh, yeah. <laughs> she would give us a spoonful of castor oil and then give us that little jar of plum uh -huh. juice to drink for the chaser you know to get rid of that taste and, and it wouldn't get rid of it, it wouldn't get rid of it <coughs> Horrible stuff. I, I, every time I'd say, every time I'd say, when I get grown, I will never take castor oil again. <laughs> so I went to the doctor a few years ago, and he said, now the one thing, I was going to have some surgery, and he said, now the one thing I want you to do, I want you to go to the drugstore and buy a bottle of castor oil, and I want you to take some tonight. And I said, no. <laughs> he said, but you have to. I said, no. I promised myself when I got grown, I would never take castor oil again. But I did. <laughs> he said I had to do it. So I did. And it tasted the same. And I don't know. Somebody had to somebody had to set up nights and figure out how to make that taste yeah. like it is because awesome. it is so horrible. Did you ever stuff. have a sugar tip? Yeah. Well, yeah. Mother would get a little bag, she'd make her a little bag, put the sugar in it, and then dip it in the castor oil, and you had to suck it all day. Yes. <laughs> well, how about calamon? Oh, I like them. What was it? <laughs> what was it? But if you took calamon, then you had to take castor oil to right. get rid of the calamon. Calamon. <laughs> 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 your life. But if you didn't have calamol, you died. <laughs> well, what exactly was calamol? I don't know, but my grandmother had it for the calamol. <laughs> oh, yes. I'd hit the door, stick out your tongue. <laughs> sit there and cry and he'd say what are you crying for and I say I want some pills too so he had the sugar pills and he gave me sugar pills <laughs> and I thought I was really big I never <laughs> cried for pills <laughs> <laughs> well when you're little though like four and five years old you know you want to do everything that everybody else does mm -hmm. so she was taking pills and I wanted some too <laughs> well I don't know what Miss Parks always, her, her remedy for everything for everybody, I've heard her say this 10 jillion times, 
was the cottonseed polis. Now, if anybody knows what that was, but she'd make a cottonseed polis and she'd put cottonseed somehow and it'd be warm and she'd put it on your stomach if you had stomach ache or something. I don't know. But she was always making polises. And I guess they were just warm stuff that they draw. I don't know. They're yeah. supposed My to draw out the yeah. Some My mother would have cold milk. She polices. probably did things like I had a maid once. <laughs> she said, uh, "My mother." She said, "I I had chicken pox, and my mother made me go out to the chicken yard, <laughs> yeah. and they made me lay down, and they ran the chickens over." What <laughs> 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 now I did for chicken pox? <laughs> They give you a bath in the water that she scalded a chicken in. The, oh yeah. Yeah, remember that? Yeah. I, I can remember. smell I can I smell a that. chicken scalded in that. <laughs> I didn't have any scars. <laughs> something wrong with you, go to someone that was born after their father died. Mm. That was if you had thrush in your mouth, because <laughs> I did. <laughs> I did. Our mother took me to Aunt Zori. Remember Aunt Zori? She was a black woman about 100 years old. Oh, Aunt Zori. that's right. My mother said it cured me. I was, Is that right? I was just about three weeks old. Uh, well, I tell you, they had to be ready back then. Yeah, well, well, I was just three weeks old. I don't know. It, it breaking out of some kind in the mouth. I don't know why. But anyway, I had it. Maybe Dr. Carroll knows. I do. Oh. <laughs> yeah. And anyway, I had it, and Mother took me to Aunt Zori. I was terrified of Aunt Zori. And I know she was a sweet, sweet little black lady. Well, I just scared to death and took care of the thrush. Well, <laughs> I was too little to know. Of course, I don't remember. Well, isn't that kind of blisters that comes in her mouth? No, it's not blisters. It's a fungus. Oh. Candida albicans. It's a white fungus. Oh. Makes a film. Pat, do you know somebody who died after... We don't see that much anymore. Mullen cough syrup. Mullen cough syrup. We use it for the group. And big sad. Well, we for the group we used a shot of coal oil, a shot of bourbon, and some lemon juice if you get it, a spoon of sugar, and hot water. Yes, and if you stuck a nail in your foot, they soaked your foot in kerosene. Or a thorn. We had thorn tree across from us, and we were always running out in the woods and stepping on a thorn, and Mother put kerosene on it. Now, wash things. I stepped on a bee, and it stung my big toe, and Ann Carroll chewed tobacco and got it all juicy and put it on my, put it on my big toe. It didn't draw it out. Uh -huh. And it did. I know, we heard that. That's what daddy always said. That's what daddy always said. Well, the three of us are, you know, that's sort of a statement of saying home remedies do work because we're all three still Absolutely. here. Absolutely. Absolutely. <laughs> Not that we're that old, but anyway, we're still here. Well, <laughs> Mother would take it, this. I don't know that you'd call it a remedy, but she would take a string, and if you had warts that came on, you know, every, every once in a while you'd have warts on you. You know what I'm going to say, don't you, Jake? She would tie knots in that string as to how many warts you had on it, go out and bury it underneath the drip of the house. <laughs> Your warts would go away. <laughs> I'm not lying, they <laughs> work. <laughs> they work. They <laughs> work. Wine string. <laughs> I know. We use dog bones. <laughs> what? After fine bones. Yeah. And rub on the ward. 
and yeah. it don't work. <laughs> I don't know how it happened, but it always worked. <laughs> it Oh, yeah, they go away anyway, but I mean, you know, it, it was magic. It worked. I've heard that story. Uh, uh, well, I've never heard of that. Yeah. You bury the string. Mm -hmm. uh -huh. mm -hmm. In the dreadful house.